I'm in Bando Station on the outskirts of Tokushima City. follow this green line, it'll bring me to the first temple of this pilgrimage. It's only about a 10 minute walk away. Today's walk is going to be an easy 17 kilometers, mostly flat, through the suburbs of Tokushima. Inside the Temple One entrance is the Temple One gift shop where you can purchase everything you need for your pilgrimage. Today is October 10th, 2022. I flew into Tokushima last night and I'm flying out of Takamatsu near Temple 88 on December 5th. That gives me 56 days to complete this pilgrimage. I've already planned out my itinerary in advance, so I know that I'm going to be walking 49 of those days and resting for seven days. The total distance of my pilgrimage is going to be 1153 kilometers, which averages out to be around 23 kilometers per walking day. I've had a lot of time to research this pilgrimage during the pandemic, so I figured I'd record it and hopefully pass along some of the knowledge that I've learned. I'm certainly no expert when it comes to this, so I'm sure I'll make some mistakes, but Hopefully it'll help you out if you're interested in coming here.
Here's the view from Temple 10. A good view of Shikoku. Japan is made up of four major islands, and Shikoku is the smallest of them. It has a population of about four million people. Most of those people are living on the north side of the island, close to the ocean. The interior of the island is made up of mountains, as you can see before you. They're all covered in lush, leafy green trees. Shikoku is famous for its natural beauty because it's the least developed of the four major islands. It's also famous for its dance festivals, like the Awa Adori, which takes place in Tokushima City every August. And of course, it's most famous for the Shikoku pilgrimage. It's day three. I'm leaving the Tokushima suburbs and heading up into the mountains for a couple of days. We're not done with Tokushima city. We'll be back through there in a couple of days. Today's hike is 18 kilometers, which is pretty short, but the elevation gain is over 1200 meters. And the trail is relatively steep. It's going to be a difficult day. My backpack is a little bit heavy as well. It's full of water and lunch. Should be a good day. The Shikoku Henro pilgrimage is a pilgrimage to 88 Buddhist temples dotted around the island of Shikoku, where it is said that a man named Kobodaishi once lived and taught Buddhism. Pilgrims, or Henros as they are called in Shikoku, have been taking this pilgrimage for almost 800 years in some form or another. The more recent 88 Temples version of the pilgrimage started between the 16th and 17th centuries. The pilgrimage route generally follows the circumference of Shikoku Island and travels through most of its major towns and cities located along the coasts.
There's a good view of downtown Tokushima, way off in the distance. Some of you might be wondering if you need to be a Buddhist to come and do this pilgrimage. The answer is no. This pilgrimage is open to everyone, regardless of race, nationality, gender, age, or social status. There's many reasons why people come to do the pilgrimage. Most, obviously, for religious reasons. Personally, I'm here because of the adventure. I've never actually been to Japan before, and I thought that this would be a good way to learn about its culture. And as a bonus, I get to learn about Buddhism along the way. Everyone is a welcome here, but it's important to remember that the pilgrimage is religious in nature, and to be very respectful of the holy places that you're going to visit. As you visit the temples, you'll notice that there's a set ritual that Henros perform while they're there. But generally, the ritual is as follows. At the front gate, stand to the left, place your hands together and bow. Once inside, use the ladle to wash your left hand and then right hand and rinse your mouth. Don't drink directly from the ladle. Ring the bell once. More than once is bad luck. At the main hall, light one candle and three sticks of incense. Ring the bell. Place a name slip and copied sutra in the bay. Place a donation in the offery box. Put your hands together and recite the sutras. At the Daishi Hall, I think that's how you say it, you worship the same way as you worshipped at the main hall. Once you've completed all your steps, you can go to the main office and donate 300 yen and receive a calligraphy stamp in your stamp book. When leaving the grounds of the temple, face the main gate and bow once. There are a lot of steps in the ritual, and I'm sure I forgot one or two of them. That being said, you're not required to do any of the steps if you don't want to. It's a very relaxed atmosphere at these Buddhist temples and they understand that not everybody is going to be a Buddhist. You can do some of the rituals or none of the rituals. It's up to you. There have been plenty of Japanese people that I've met that only do some of the rituals.
You'll find these statues all along the pilgrimage route. We are, of course, talking about Kobodaishi. Kobodaishi, who also has the name Kukai, was born in Shikoku in the year 774 and died in the year 835. During his early years, he traveled to China where he studied Buddhism from the masters. Upon returning to Japan, Kukai became a powerful and influential figure in Japanese Buddhism. Kukai was bestowed with the name Kobodeshi, which translates to the Grand Master who propagated the Dharma. He is the most famous Buddhist to have ever lived in Japan. Here's the hotel I stayed in last night. It's a converted school. They have a shuttle service that will pick you up and drop you off from the Henro Trail. I can recommend it. It was nice. It's day seven. We're finally leaving Tokushima City behind us. And we're heading south for a couple days to the Pacific Ocean along the southern coast of Shikoku Island. Today's hike is 20 kilometers. First, I'll be heading up this mountain here to the very top to visit Temple 20. And then I'll go down the other side and up another mountain very similar to this one to visit Temple 21. Total elevation gain for today is 1,200 meters again. So another difficult day. It was supposed to rain today, but in the last couple days the forecast changed and now it's going to be a high of 26 and sunny. Perfect. At the bottom of difficult mountains, they'll leave some walking sticks.
The only way to complete this pilgrimage is by visiting all 88 official Buddhist temples. How you get to the temples is completely up to you. You could walk, bike, take a car, take a bus. I've read that back in the 90s, when Japan's economy was booming, some people would take a helicopter or a limousine to each of the temples. I don't think they do that anymore. It doesn't matter which order you visit the temples. The traditional way is to start at Temple 1 and walk clockwise around Shikoku Island to Temple 88. But you can do them out of order, or you can do them backwards if you want. Monkeys. Okay, the monkeys are gone. I was going to finish off by saying that the most popular way to complete the pilgrimage these days is by car or by tour bus. Walking is not nearly as popular as it used to be hundreds of years ago when there were no cars or buses. But it's still the funnest way to do it. It's walking day number nine. I spent yesterday resting here in the, in the town of Minami. Today there's multiple official routes that I can take and I've decided to take the most difficult one, which also looks like it's gonna be the best one. Today's hike is about 20 kilometers with uh, a decent amount of elevation gain but I think it's definitely going to be worth it. Here we go.
If you're going to come to Shikoku to walk this pilgrimage, then you're going to need a route guide. There are many books available online regarding the Shikoku pilgrimage, but you only really need to purchase one. And that book is called the Shikoku Japan 88 Route Guide. It's the only English guide that is frequently updated with the newest information and routes. The book is mostly made up of maps, which show the various official routes, as well as other useful information, such as washroom locations, rest areas, and of course, temples. It also contains the basics of what you need to know about the Shikoku pilgrimage. The book can be purchased from Amazon, their website, as well as from the Temple One gift shop. Many people think that Kate Moroto is one of the most boring parts of this pilgrimage. And I can understand where they could be coming from. The distance from Temple 23 to Temple 24 is 80 kilometers. And the recommended pilgrimage route follows a very busy highway. Even through tunnels loud, polluted tunnels. I could see why people would think that would be boring. Luckily, there are many alternate routes that parallel the highway that you can take to minimize your time on the highway. And I highly recommend that you take those routes. Nobody wants to come all the way to Japan to walk along a busy highway. I certainly don't. Of course, the alternate routes are often more difficult and slower than the main recommended route, but they are also much more scenic and enjoyable. You could go this way into the Tunnel of Doom, or you could go this way to nature's beauty. I know which way I'm going.
There are some sections of this pilgrimage where busy roads are unavoidable. I've had over a year to plan out my walking itinerary and I've tried my best to stay away from busy roads. Despite that, I'm still walking an average of four kilometers a day along busy roads. Obviously, some days there's absolutely no busy roads and on others, there's lots. Today happens to be a lots day. 15 kilometers of busy roads today. Now, in this pilgrimage, you have to take the good with the bad. The bad, busy road. The good, it's not raining. There's a nice breeze and a pretty good view of the ocean. Walking day number 12. Only a little bit of busy road today, so that's good. Today's walk is going to be 23 kilometers around the tip of Cape Maroto. I'll be visiting Temple 24, which is up on a small hill, as well as Temple 25, which is in the town of Maroto where I will be staying for the night. The tip of Cape Maroto is a little bit of a touristy place. So there should be lots to see. And I'm going to start with that thing right in front of me.
The most popular times of the year to walk this pilgrimage are April and May for the springtime and October and November for the fall. The rainy season in Japan starts in June, with the summers being extremely hot and humid. Not very good conditions to walk. The coldest winter months are January and February. It doesn't often snow in the lower elevations, but snow can be quite common in the mountains, which could cause treacherous trail conditions. If you're interested in the fall leaves, the leaves change color around mid-November. And if you're interested in the cherry blossom season, that usually starts around mid-March. I'm just outside the town of Haki, in front of Loki Cave. There are many points of interest along the Henro route. Natural formations, like this one. Lookout points, castles, ruins, interesting shrines, cool temples that are not part of the official 88. usually no signs along the Henro route to tell you that you're passing these points of interest and often when there are signs they are in Japanese so it's up to you to research and find these places you could use Google Maps and of course you always have the Henro guide which tells you about most of these places It's up to you to take the time and walk the extra distance to come and see these places. I think that most Henros often just walk the fastest route to get to the 88 temples, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I highly recommend that you take the time to go and see these places, because they're worth it.
It's walking day number 15. Today's hike is about 24 kilometers. Much of it along this multi-use pathway, which is actually just a, a seawall. But a nice view and a nice breeze. I won't be visiting any temples today and there's not much elevation gain. I'll be finishing today's hike in the outskirts of Kochi City with a population of about 300,000 people. Kochi City is the largest city on the southern shores of Shikoku. I'll be walking through Kochi City for the next couple of days, visiting seven temples. You'll find that most of the temples are located around high population areas. And as you leave those high population areas, the official temples get more and more spread out. Of the walking henros that I've seen so far on this pilgrimage, the vast majority of them are Japanese, which makes sense. This pilgrimage is not well known outside of Japan. And of those Japanese, the vast majority of them are men around the age of 60. I actually saw one guy who must have been in his 80s and he was walking up a pretty steep part of a mountain as I passed him. He seemed in pretty good spirits. It makes sense that they're older. A lot of people in Japan don't get a lot of time off until they retire. I haven't seen any girls yet, however, I've met a few Japanese girls who say that they have walked the pilgrimage. And I've only met a few international people so far walking the pilgrimage. Although, I think this year, Japan just opened up in the fall. So, I'm not surprised, I haven't seen many. Japan has been promoting this pilgrimage more and more to international audiences. I assume that every year more and more international tourists show up to walk the pilgrimage.
Before coming to this pilgrimage, I had several people ask me if training was required to do a pilgrimage. Now, unless you're in your early 20s, I would say yes, you definitely need to do some training. Luckily, training is easy and fun. All you have to do is go outside and start walking. For me, I started training back in the spring. I would go out two to three days a week to my favorite hiking area with a full backpack and start walking. Initially, I was walking five to seven kilometers a day. And then near the end, I was walking about 15 to 20 kilometers a day. I would often incorporate mountains and hills. You want to hike long distances to get your body ready. In particular, your feet and your joints and your back. And you want to incorporate mountains or hills to increase your stamina. You're going to need a lot of stamina out here. As I've mentioned before, I've seen lots of guys who are in their 60s and one guy who was in his 80s. But they all had one thing in common. They were all in very good shape. Now, you don't need to be an athlete, obviously. But you do need to come prepared. Walking 20 kilometers in one day, it's pretty difficult. But doing it every day for weeks at a time, that is difficult. So be ready. Unlike some other popular pilgrimages from around the world, you probably will not be able to find a daily walking itinerary. It's very difficult to create a universally accepted itinerary for this pilgrimage when there are so many different official routes that you can take. Some routes just take longer than others. In general, you'll have to create your own walking itinerary that suits your physical ability, as well as choosing the routes that you would enjoy walking. I've read that on average, people take between 42 and 49 days to walk the pilgrimage, and that's not including rest days. Personally, I chose 49 days because I'll be taking 
more difficult routes. And I'm on vacation, so I don't want to stress myself out too much. When planning a day's walk, you'll need to remember that in the spring, sunrise is at 5.30 a.m. and sunset is around 6.30 p.m. And in the fall, sunrise is around 6.30 a.m. and sunset is around 5.30 p.m. Temples are open between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. You'll have to take into account the amount of time that you're going to stay at the temples. Personally, I've been spending an average of about 15 minutes at each temple, sometimes shorter when they're really small and sometimes longer when they're very large. You'll also have to take into account the elevation gain that you'll be doing that day. Some of those mountains are very large and take a long time to walk over. And you'll also have to take into account the type of accommodation that you'll be staying in. Some of the accommodations require you to be there before 5 p.m. I'll leave my walking itinerary for anyone who's interested. But everyone's different and you might not like it. Oh, there's a view here. That's a good way to end off. It's walking day number 19. It's 20 past 6 in the morning. Today is a big day. I'm going to be traveling 39 kilometers today. But I have a shortcut. I will show you what it is. This boat is a ferry that's popular with walking henros as an alternate route. It services small communities along the coast and if you're here during the weekday, you might see some school children get on the ferry to go to school. But today is a Saturday, so it's just going to be me and some other Henros. This ferry only runs three times a day, so you'll have to get here for the 7.10 a.m. departure. It doesn't run on Sundays. This ferry will shave off about 10 kilometers of walking today. I can see my house from here. I wish. It's November 1st. Walking day number 20. It's raining. And it's going to rain all day. If you have a set walking itinerary like I do, then you're going to have to buy some good rain gear. I took the train back to Kochi City and spent a couple days resting there. It's a nice city to take a rest in. There's lots to do. There's a big castle to see. And I was there on a Sunday. And apparently the Kochi Sunday Market is the largest in all of Japan. Over the next few days, I'll be walking down to Cape Ashizuri, which is the furthest southwest point of Shikoku Island. There's not many temples out this way, 
I'll be visiting one every two days or so. Let's go. Japanese convenience store. I feel like I've been walking through the Sahara Desert and I have come upon an oasis. Japan has one of the highest convenience stores per capita ratio in the entire world. And as the name implies, these convenience stores are very convenient for walking hen rows. They provide shelter, it's dry inside when it's raining, it's cool inside when it's hot, and it's warm inside when it's cold. They have very good food and drinks for very reasonable prices. There's a washroom, there's a bank machine, some convenience stores have seating areas, and some, like these Lawson's, have free Wi-Fi. Only a few sections of the pilgrimage are not serviced by these convenience stores. And of course, the most important thing about convenience stores, they sell ice cream. Yum. I'm going to talk about the most expensive part of coming to this pilgrimage, and that is accommodations. There's lots of different types of accommodations that are available to you as a hen row, and there's too many to go over in one day. So today I'm just going to start with the basics. First you have minshukus, which are essentially Japanese-style bed and breakfasts. They have Japanese-style rooms with tatami mats, and for a bed, you lay out a sleeping pad with your blankets. Usually it comes with a tiny pillow. And it's not as comfortable as a Western-style bed, but you do get used to it. Ryokens. Uh, Ryokin is a traditional Japanese-style hotel, up to 12 rooms. Once again, the bedrooms are Japanese style. Minchukus and Ryokins are the most common type of accommodations you'll see here as a hand rope. The average price is around 4,500 yen. Sometimes a little more expensive, sometimes less expensive. 
these types of accommodations are rarely available on booking websites. You usually have to call to make a booking. I did find an English version of a website called Henro House, which has about 50 Minchiku and Ryokan spread out all along the pilgrimage, and you can reserve those online through the website. Very helpful. Next up, we have business hotels, which are just like regular hotels, but with very basic amenities, very small rooms, usually just a single bed and a tiny bathroom. Some business hotels are available to be booked online, but a lot of them you have to call to make a reservation. The average price for a business hotel, the type that you as a Henro would be going to, is around 5,000 yen. Sometimes more expensive, sometimes less. Next up we have regular hotels. They're the same as Western hotels. Bigger room, bigger bed. Regular hotels are 6,000 yen and up and can be booked online through booking websites. And we have onsen hotels which are essentially large ryokans, and they have a Japanese-style hot spring for bathing. If you've never been to an onsen, you're probably going to have to watch a YouTube video to see how to do it properly, because there's lots of rules, and you don't want to mess it up. Onsens can be found for around 6,000 yen and up. They can often be booked online as well. And last up, we have temple lodging. Some of the temples along the pilgrimage have traditional style Japanese ryokans, but there's some extra added steps to go with them. Usually food is included, and in the traditional Japanese Buddhist way, the food is vegetarian. Sometimes you'll be required to attend a service, either in the evening or in the morning, which could take between half an hour to an hour. Strangers have been giving me things on this pilgrimage. 
in Shikoku, the act of giving something to a henro is called osetai. Osetai is ingrained in Shikoku culture. It goes back many, many centuries. I've been given things like oranges, cups of tea, drinks, chocolates, trinkets. A stranger came up to me and gave me a little bit of change and he told me about a drink machine up the road and I took him up on the offer. Thank you. It's important to know that in Shikoku, Osetai is a religious experience for these strangers and you should be very grateful when you receive Osetai. You should always accept Osetai Unless, of course, you have a very good reason, such as an allergy. When researching Osetai, I came across an interesting story. Hundreds of years ago, homeless people and lepers used to come to Shikoku and walk the pilgrimage because it was one of the only places in Japan where they felt accepted. That's pretty cool. It's the morning of walking day number 24. I've made it to Cape Ashizuri. Today's walk is 26 kilometers, about 800 meters of elevation gain, and it should be pretty scenic. I'll be visiting one temple today, right at the tip of Cape Ashizuri. Every once in a while, you're going to have to find a stick of destruction to help you with the spider webs. I'm ready. The most common type of spider that you'll see here is a big black and yellow spider. Scary looking. And they're everywhere. But they are not dangerous. So you'll be okay. I guess now that we're on the subject of animals and insects, you should know that there are some dangerous things out here in the woods. We've got wild boar, poisonous snakes, poisonous centipedes. Personally, I've only seen one snake so far. And it was the non-poisonous type.
I'm halfway through day 25. I've been walking along this desolate mountain road for about 12 kilometers now, and I've only seen a few cars. And they spent a lot of money to build this road that nobody uses. We're at a milestone in my journey. This is the halfway point for my entire pilgrimage already. That was fast. Time flies when you're having fun. Physically, I'm feeling good. I think the first nine days were the most difficult for me. Certainly after day nine, my legs were very tired. I was very happy to have a day off in the town of Minami. And the Moroto coast was mostly flat, so it gave me time to recover. And I've felt good ever since. Uh, Japanese people have been very friendly and hospitable. I don't eat fish, but Japanese cuisine has a lot to offer besides fish. I've been eating a lot. The pilgrimage has been going pretty much exactly how I expected, so, so far, so good. Accommodations Part 2. Low-cost accommodations. I guess we can start off with hostels. Hostels are not as popular in Japan as, for instance, in Europe. There's just not that many of them, and on Shikoku especially. You'll definitely find them in the bigger cities, and sometimes you might find them in the towns and smaller villages. Most of the hostels that I've seen, you can book them online. And the average price seems to be about 3,000 yen. Next up for low-cost accommodations, we have Tsuyado, which are low-cost temple accommodations. Some of the temples along the way will have low-cost or free, depending on who you ask, accommodations. I shouldn't confuse these with the temple hotels, although some of the temples have both temple hotels and the low-cost tsuyados available. Basically, the tsuyados usually consist of a basic hut where you can set up your sleeping gear inside and sleep there for the night. Not all temples have the tsuyados and Sometimes a temple might have a tsuyado, but it might not be available. It might be closed. Another thing about tsuyados is that if a female Henro shows up first asking for the tsuyado, then only females would be allowed to stay there for the night. Same goes for men. Another low-cost accommodation is Zenconyados. Basically very similar to Tsuyados, but they are privately owned. You can find some Tsuyados on the pilgrimage guide. Some of them are just open for anyone to use, and others you'll have to call someone to come and unlock the Zenken Yado so you can stay for the night. Some people online seem to think that the Tsuyados and Zenken Yados are free. 
and others seem to think that you need to leave a donation. Nobody seems to have a proper answer for how much you're supposed to leave. Some say 300 yen and some say 1,000 yen. So I'm not so sure about that. The thing about the Tsuyados and Zinkinyados is you can never rely on them. You always have to have a backup plan in case it's not available. And you're not going to know if it's available or not until you get there. I guess as a backup plan you can get accommodations at a Minshuku or a hotel. But sometimes those are not available at the last minute either. In a worst case scenario you could sleep at a pilgrimage rest area. There seem to be hundreds along this pilgrimage of these rest areas of various types. It's illegal to actually sleep in one overnight, but people do it, both Japanese and foreigners alike. Some of the rest areas are more suited to sleeping than others. You'll see that they have nice benches to sleep on sometimes. And some of the rest areas have running water nearby, as well as toilet facilities, which would be very important if you're sleeping there overnight. If you do plan on staying at these rest areas, you're probably going to want to bring a mosquito net. Also, if you're unsure if you're allowed to stay at the rest area, it's always a good idea to ask a local. I mean, if the rest area is in the middle of nowhere, no one's going to say anything. But if it's in the middle of a city, then there might be issues and you should be prepared to move along if somebody asks you to leave. Children have put up some drawings along this section of trail to encourage Henros along. It's a bit of a steep trail in sections, but it's well maintained. It's been nice. Thanks, children. I've reached the prefecture of Ehime. A prefecture is similar to a province or a state in a different country. Shikoku has four prefectures, Tokushima, Kochi, Ehime, and Kagawa. Tokushima and Kochi also have cities of the same name, so don't be confused by that. Each of the prefectures represents a different stage of the pilgrimage. Tokushima represents the stage of awakening, where everything is new and interesting and fun. And then Kochi represents the stage of ascetic training, where you start to realize how difficult this pilgrimage is really going to be. Ehime represents the stage of enlightenment, where you begin to understand how to achieve the goal that you set out for yourself. And finally, Kagawa represents the stage of nirvana, where hopefully you have achieved your goal and attained inner peace.
Some of you might be new to pilgrimages and might want to know what I brought in my backpack. So the backpack I'm using is a Deuter AC Light 26, 26 liters. If you're going to be bringing lots of food with you, you'll probably want a bigger backpack. Of course, I got the basics in here, phone charger, sunscreen, emergency toilet paper, toiletries. For clothes, I brought one pair of pants, two shirts, two underwear, and two pairs of socks. And that's in my backpack, so I'm also wearing clothes myself. The socks, I recommend these toe-type socks to prevent blisters on your toes. I have a lightweight mid-layered jacket, outer Gore-Tex rain jacket, breathable rain pants, and ultralight umbrella. You don't really need the umbrella, but for me, it's a real morale booster to have a roof over your head when it's pouring outside. So the guidebook says that your backpack is supposed to weigh under five kilograms, and I agree with that. Everything you see here is about 4.5 kilograms. You have to remember that you're going to be bringing more stuff than just what you see here. You've got your stamp book. Stamp book is quite light, so that's good. And of course, you're going to be bringing snacks and lunch and drinks, which are heavy. That all adds up. The lighter your backpack, the more fun you're going to have. I don't think anyone's finished a pilgrimage and thought to themselves, I wish my backpack was heavier. I don't think it really happens that way. You're also going to want to bring a hat with you. It's very sunny in Shikoku. It's important to bring lightweight, high quality equipment with you. It's also important that your clothing is quick drying. So most of the accommodations that you're going to be staying at will have washers and dryers, but some of them will only have washers. So you'll have to hang your clothes up and hopefully they'll be dry by the morning. Shoes. You're not going to want to bring hiking boots out here. The vast majority of your walking is going to be on hard surfaces. So you'll need something with thick, comfortable soles with lots of cushioning and preferably Gore-Tex because you don't want wet feet when it's raining. It's November 12th, walking day number 30. I just spent yesterday in Uwajima City resting. I visited their castle, which was cool, and some interesting shrines. Penis! Today I'll be walking 21 kilometers and visiting three temples, the first of which is right in front of me. After today I'll be walking east for three days up into the mountains to a town called Kumakojin, where the next two temples are located. still day 30 and I've made it to the top of this mountain range and the guidebook wants me to take this trail down the mountain on this side and follow a road that goes to a town called Sayo. When I was researching this area I found out that there's a trail that follows the ridge of this mountain range and eventually goes down into Sayo. So I think I'm going to try and take this route. There are no rules regarding which routes you take for this pilgrimage. And I've been taking advantage of that fact. Often taking my own routes to avoid busy roads. This is the first one where I'm going to be going well off the official pilgrimage route. I'm hoping it works out.
what you're seeing in front of you is not a church. It is a wedding venue. Some people in Japan, just like people in the West, love the idea of having a big fantasy style wedding. But in Japan, they have to use fake churches and cathedrals. And sometimes they'll even hire fake white priests to marry them. That's kind of funny. It's said that Kukai slept under this bridge 1,200 years ago. Well, maybe not this bridge, but the bridge that was here. It's tradition not to tap your walking stick as you cross this bridge, or else you might disturb Kukai's rest. You might have noticed by now that some people are wearing a white outfit. That is the traditional outfit of a henro. It goes back centuries. Some parts of the outfit include a sedge hat, a white vest, a stole that goes around your neck, a satchel to carry candles and incense and your stamp book. I've been told that wearing white shows that you are ready to face death on your journey. I'm sure centuries ago, death was a real possibility on this pilgrimage. But today, it's pretty safe. You don't have to wear any of the outfit if you don't want. You can wear some of it or none of it. It's a very relaxed pilgrimage and no one's going to tell you what to do. I've seen some Japanese people just wear a white shirt or a regular white hat. It is recommended that you do wear something to show that you are a henro. You'll have a lot more social interactions with the locals if they know that you're a henro. You can purchase all parts of the outfit at the Temple One gift shop. There are many, many different types of Henro trail signs on this pilgrimage. And it's at times like these where you have signs pointing in different directions where you definitely need some sort of map. One direction might take much longer than the other. One direction might be much more difficult than the other. And the only way to know really is to have a map with you or some sort of trail guide, or some sort of GPS. It's November 16th, walking day number 34. I'm just leaving Kumakojin. It's cold out. Kumakojin is at an elevation of 500 meters and it's well away from the ocean, so the climate is a little bit different around here. I forgot that I had some gloves buried deep in my backpack, and I'm thankful that I remembered that I had them today. So there's a tip, bring gloves. Today's hike is 20 kilometers. I'll be going to visit Temple 45, which is 
I believe, the most remote of all of the official temples. Mid-November is peak season for autumn color leaves in Kumakojin. I expect that today will be quite scenic. Walking day number 35. On a clear day, you would be able to see Matsuyama City down in the valley here. 
at a population of over 500,000 people. It's the largest city on Shikoku. Today and tomorrow, I'll be visiting eight temples as I walk around the east side of the city. After that, I'm going to take a break for two days in the city. And my knees, they're ready for a rest. They don't hurt, but they're quite stiff. Of course, there is one final piece of the Henro outfit that I have not mentioned yet. And that is the walking stick. The walking stick is considered the most sacred item that a Henro carries. It's said that it is the embodiment of Kobodeshi, who is there to guide you and keep you safe on your journey. Historically, the walking stick was used for self-defense against wild animals and other dangers. It was also used as a grave marker for henros that were unable to finish the journey. You'll find that most walking henros do carry the walking stick. However, it is not required. I've seen some Japanese people using trekking poles. I saw one Japanese guy have both trekking poles and a walking stick strapped to his back. Personally, I brought trekking poles. I've been kind of wondering if it could be said that the trekking poles are also the embodiment of Kobodashi while I'm here on Shikoku. But I suspect that's sacrilege. I don't know. You can purchase the walking stick at the Temple One gift shop. I've mentioned the stamp book before. The stamp book is 1500 yen to purchase, and to get a stamp at each of the temples is 300 yen. The 300 yen is considered to be a donation and not a fee, and in return for the donation, they will give you a stamp. I highly recommend that you do get a stamp book for a number of reasons. First, it's a great memento of Shikoku to bring back home with you. Second, it's a good way to donate to the temples so that they can maintain the temples for future generations of Henros. And third, it's a good way to participate in the activities that Henros do at the temples. For me, I haven't been doing all of the activities. I've been bowing as I go in and washing my hands and ringing the bell, but I have not been doing the sutras. Instead, I'll just go and explore the temple. But I found that getting the stamp as I leave the temple was quite fun. Standing in line, waiting your turn, and then watching them do the calligraphy. It's a good way to be more involved in the Henro culture. This is pretty cool. So yeah, I recommend that you purchase the book. It's worth it.
It's November 21st, walking day number 37. I just spent the last two days resting in Matsuyama City. Of course, they have a big castle, and they also have some goofy touristy stuff to do, and a vibrant downtown. I saw more foreigners in Matsuyama than I've seen in all of Shikoku combined. It's a cool city. Today's walk is just under 30 kilometers. It's mostly flat and I won't be visiting any temples today. At the end of this walk, I'll be at the northern end of Shikoku. The north side of Shikoku is made up of a bunch of small and large cities and all of their suburbs have combined to create one huge suburb across the entire northern end of Shikoku. I'll be walking for 11 days through that suburb, periodically walking up into the mountains to visit a few temples. There's still about 35 temples to go over the course of the 11 days, so there's going to be a lot of temples every day from here on out. Here's where I ate lunch today. Who would have thought that there would be a random hot dog restaurant in some random village in Shikoku? It was good. Let's talk about the food budget. In my opinion, if you're planning to eat at grocery stores and convenience stores, I think that 2,500 yen a day is a comfortable amount of money to spend. I'm sure some people will say that you can do it for cheaper, and it's true. If you liked eating lots of rice and instant noodles, you can do it for less. But 2,500 yen is just my opinion. The restaurants in Shikoku are very reasonably priced, in my opinion, compared to other Western countries I've been to. The price that you see on the menu is the price that you pay. It includes the tax, and there's no tipping in Japan. Some accommodations, such as Minshikus and Ryokens, do offer meals. They're usually very traditional Japanese-style meals with lots of fish. They can sometimes substitute the fish for something else if you let them know in advance. The price for breakfast and supper at a Minshiku or Ryokan is around 2,500 yen, give or take.
This is why you bring an umbrella. on the Shikoku pilgrimage. Some municipalities, such as cities and towns, will have tenting areas, which are sometimes free, and sometimes up to 500 yen. There are private campgrounds as well. From what I'm seeing, they're usually around 2,000 yen. There's not a lot of campgrounds along the Shikoku pilgrimage, but there are some. It's not legal to just set up your tent anywhere in Shikoku. However, both Japanese and foreigners do stealth camp along the pilgrimage. There are various places that you can set up your tent. From what I've seen, many people do set up their tents in the pilgrimage rest areas. Some of the rest areas have washrooms and running water nearby, so that would be the likely place that you would want to set up your tent. It's recommended that you bring a self-supporting standalone tent since you'll often be setting up on hard surfaces. If you do decide to bring a tent on the pilgrimage, I suggest you do some research into how to keep your backpack as light as possible.
in my opinion, 10,000 yen a day is a comfortable amount to budget if you want to come to Shikoku. That includes staying at accommodations every night, regularly eating at Minshiku's, Ryokin's, or cheap restaurants, laundry, the cost of a data plan for your phone, transportation expenses, buying parts of the Henro outfit, as well as the donations for each of the temples. I've already talked about ways to reduce your costs, such as tenting, staying at Zenkenyados or Tsuyados, or staying at hostels when they're available. You can also buy your food from grocery stores or convenience stores. There are other ways to reduce your costs. The faster you complete the pilgrimage, the less you'll have to spend. Some options to do that are walk longer distances, or you could do a hybrid pilgrimage where you walk the sections where there are temples and take transportation to skip the sections where there are no temples. Many people do the hybrid pilgrimage and it saves weeks. Another option for you is to only do a small section of the pilgrimage. Most people who walk the Shikoku pilgrimage only walk small sections at a time. A good section to walk would be Temple 1 to Temple 23. It takes about seven to nine days to complete, and there's a good variety of walking environments and lots of temples to see. It should give you a good idea of what the Shikoku pilgrimage is about. And if you want, afterwards, you can come back to complete the pilgrimage. When I was researching about Japan, I read that the younger generation can often speak a little bit of English, whereas the older generation cannot. Well, on Shikoku, I found that the younger generation cannot speak English at all, whereas some of the older Henros that I've met can speak a little bit of English, which is nice. Now, I don't expect people in Japan to be able to speak English. They live in Japan, they only need Japanese. It just means that you have to work a little harder to communicate with them. I found that learning a few simple words helps a lot. Words like yes, thank you, hello, good morning, sorry. Simple words that you use every day. Of course, there are translation apps that can help you. I've been using Google Translate to translate signs and menus. And I've been using iPhone Translate to do speech to text. You have to be careful about the apps that you use because some of them don't work if you don't have an internet connection. The most difficulty you're going to have communicating is when you need to make a reservation over the phone. Many of the accommodations are only available to reserve over the phone. What I usually do is I'll just call and ask slowly if they speak English. Sometimes they do and you're able to make a reservation. Often they do not speak English and in those cases you're going to have to find someone who speaks Japanese to call on your behalf. Usually the best way to do that is if you're staying at an accommodation, you'll find someone who works there and they will call the next accommodation to make your reservation for you.
It's walking day number 43. It's a nice crisp morning. This was the view from my accommodation. Today's walk is 20 kilometers over a giant mountain. At the top of that mountain is Temple 66 at an elevation of more than 900 meters. It is the highest point for the entire pilgrimage. Let's go check it out. There are a few sections of the pilgrimage where food and accommodations are hard to find. Usually those sections have public transportation to get you to the nearest town. The area around Temple 65 and Temple 66 is a difficult area. Not only are there very few food and accommodation options, but both Temple 65 and 66 are on large mountains with a lot of elevation gain to walk. And the worst part is, there's no public transportation around here. If you want to get out of here, you'll have to take a taxi, which is expensive. I recommend that you take extra time to plan your walking itinerary in the days leading up to this section, as well as through this section so that you can get the accommodations that you want and walk the distances that you're comfortable with.
Several weeks ago, I was talking about Osetai and how lepers and homeless people used to come to Shikoku. Well, it turns out that homeless people are still here walking the Henro Trail. The Japanese have a name for them, Shokugyo Henro, which roughly translates to career pilgrim or full-time pilgrim. You might see them begging in the cities or close to temples. There does not seem to be very many of them. I've only seen two for my entire time in Shikoku. Japan has an excellent social safety net. There are very few truly homeless people in Japan. The homeless people who are here walking the Henro Trail are here by choice. Now that I'm getting close to the end of my pilgrimage, I can sort of understand the attraction of just staying on the Henro Trail. The life of a Henro is a simple one. All you have to do is eat, sleep, and walk. Three attainable goals that you can accomplish every single day. If you're going to be staying at very low-cost accommodations, you might end up meeting one of these homeless Henros. I haven't read anything to indicate that they are dangerous, but they might ask you for money. Marugame City. Below me through the trees here is Temple 75, Zensuji Temple. It's considered one of the most holy of the temples on the pilgrimage because it's the site where Kukai was born. It's said that Kukai founded this temple back in year 807. Around that little hill over there is Temple 74, which I will go to next. I've been doing some of the temples out of order because it works better with the routes that I want to take.
during the pandemic, I had a lot of time to obsess about the routes that I was going to take on this pilgrimage. I even did a statistical breakdown of the types of environments that I would be walking through. Now that I've almost completed this pilgrimage, I can confirm the numbers that I found. I have to warn you though, that these numbers are for my pilgrimage and your pilgrimage might be different. The first category is dirt trails. 12% of my pilgrimage has been on dirt trails, just like this one. Sometimes you might see a dirt road, but they are very uncommon in Japan. In Japan, they like to pave all their roads. Most trails are well-maintained. Some of the alternate trails are not well-maintained. Next up, we have about 8% paved trails. So paved trails or a seawall or a multi-use pathway where bikes are allowed. Generally, where cars are not allowed to go. After that, we have about 58% quiet roads. It includes abandoned roads, farming roads, forest service roads, mountain roads, quiet streets. Generally, where you might see a car occasionally. Sometimes never. And the last category is busy roads which make up about 22% of my pilgrimage. Cars and trucks constantly going by. It's noisy and uncomfortable. Usually there's a sidewalk and sometimes there's not. Now, if you're going to be taking the recommended route, you'll be walking a lot less trails and well over 30% busy roads. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your pilgrimage. I'm just letting you know the numbers before you come here. This pilgrimage is not a mystical walk through the forests and fields of Japan. Although there are quite a few parts of the pilgrimage that are like that. This pilgrimage covers all aspects of Japanese life on Shikoku. You'll be walking through farmlands, fields, over the mountains, through the forests, over the waters, through the cities and towns, through downtowns and industrial areas, through farming villages, fishing villages, and even surfing villages. That's what you're going to see on the pilgrimage. Some parts of this pilgrimage are going to be amazing and some parts frustrating, but overall it's good. Now this is cool. Somebody left a care package for Henros on this trail. Have a drink. Have some candy. Whoever did this, thank you.
there are life-size dolls set up all along the Shikoku Henro Trail. They're set up in various positions. They're quite amusing. Now, I'm not sure if this is a common occurrence in the rest of Japan, but I do know that there is a village called Nagoro in a remote part of Shikoku. The village has mostly been abandoned, but one of the final residents decided to make hundreds of dolls to repopulate the village. It's become a little bit of a tourist attraction. Unfortunately, it's well off the Henro Trail, so I will not be able to visit it. Have I mentioned that there are a lot of stairs on this pilgrimage? Well, there are a lot of stairs on this pilgrimage, and they are often steep and uneven. And they're wearing my legs out. I'm at the base of this mountain here, and near the top is Temple 85. Now I have two options to get there. I can walk straight ahead here and walk up the mountain, or if I'm feeling really lazy, I can take a cable car up the mountain. Now, if Kukai was here, what would he tell me to do? Oh, I think I know. December 4th, walking day number 49, the last day. I'm going to miss my Henro life. I've really enjoyed it. Today's hike is 20 kilometers. I'll be visiting temples 87 and 88. Temple 88 is on the other side of a big mountain. 750 meters tall. I've heard that it gets quite steep near the peak. Sounds like fun. Let's do it. The mountain has come into view in the distance. Looks intimidating. I'm about seven kilometers away from Temple 88 at the base of the mountain. And in front of me is the Henro Museum, which is a must see if you've walked all this way. There's some fun interactive displays as well as some old pictures to look at. And they'll give you a certificate of completion as well. I think we're at the fun part now. Yeah, it's starting to get a little steep. Okay, 
This part of the pilgrimage is the steepest. A nice scramble to the top. Cool. Almost there now. Made it to the top. I think this is one of those mystical areas. I love this. I think I said I love this at least once every day that I was walking. It's been good. That's Temple 88 down there. Almost done. People leave their walking stick here at Temple 88. Temple 1 is about 40 kilometers from here. Some people prefer to walk the extra distance to Temple 1 to complete the loop around Shikoku, as well as leave their walking stick and Koboreshi, where they found him. But my pilgrimage is going to end here at Temple 88. This is going to be a very long video, and if you've made it to the end, it's obvious that you're very interested in the Shikoku pilgrimage. By watching this video, you should have a pretty good idea of what it's about. If you're interested in coming here, I can wholeheartedly recommend that you do it. It's not a perfect pilgrimage, but it is an epic adventure, a journey that you're going to remember for the rest of your life, just like I will. Do it. It's awesome. <laughs>